Good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to this Mastering Wildlife Photography webinar. से तुम्हारा भी फोन कर रहा हूँ। Good evening, everyone, and warm welcome to this uh, webinar. So we'll be able to start maybe another uh, five minute time. Please uh, join and uh, get settled. It's almost time, guys. So we are we are waiting for for people to join in, and probably we'll start off in next minute or two, and uh, we'll try to make the session very interactive. And uh, I'm sure we'll all we'll all go back with loads and loads of lesson, lots of tips from the experts, and hopefully it will be interactive, learning, and a fun filled session. Looking forward to a great session, guys. So just. uh let's have a patience of about a minute or two and then we'll start off yeah. and during this session any of you have any kind of doubt or clarification please put it on q and a and we will answer it you know at the end of the session yeah. Thank 
Should we start, sir? Yes, sir. No, sir. Let's start. Let's start. Let's start. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Naufal. I founded uh, Honeycomb Creative Support about 14 years before. And uh, we are a, a marketing communication agency based out of Bangalore and with uh, branches in Hyderabad and Mumbai. So Photostop is a fine art print division of our honeycomb. So we, we use acid-free canvases and archival papers for prints, you know, what we do here. And we've been partnering with a lot of photographers, artists worldwide for this fine art print and archival, you know, archival quality prints and exhibitions and all. Just to name a few, uh, we, we keep uh, helping this uh, TGIS group and based out of Bangalore for their exhibition and then the yp is a youth photographic society and then wap the wildlife action photography hyderabad and bangalore and the dcp expeditions uh, out of Tha based out of thani and also the photographic society of india mumbai i think till now we might have done almost about uh, three lakh plus prints and uh, more than three thousand photographers we give service uh, pan india and worldwide <coughs> We even help photographers to develop their websites as we have an internal uh, website team and promote their uh, website and social media and other, you know, digital, uh, using other uh, digital marketing technologies. And uh, we are in the verge of actually starting in a school, a Honeycomb School of Creative Studies, even uh, the photography workshops for beginners and, and all will be you know, added in that uh, creative school. Uh, so this is an overall. Uh, so we are about uh, you know 100 plus people, and we spread it across these three regions, and um, uh, that's all overall about Honeycomb. And uh, I welcome uh, all uh, the panelists, uh, Mohan sir, Masood sir, and uh, Uday sir, and as well as Jitu sir, and as well as my colleagues, and each every and uh, every one of you already, you know, uh, very excitedly you know waiting for uh, for this uh, webinar. And I'll give a very brief introduction about uh, the uh, uh, the today's uh, the main presenter, uh, Jitender uh, Govindani. Uh, he's a professor by passion and a wildlife photographer. And Jitender Govindani has uh, been uh, hooked on to wildlife photography for the past 11 years. And wildlife photography is now an essential part of his life. And he specialized in tiger photography and he's popularly known as coffee table book man of India. Welcome you, sir. And also, I'm uh, handing over to you. Please uh, take over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nofal, sir. Uh, thank you for that uh, introduction. I'm really happy, proud, and uh, feel elated to be part of this particular uh, learning session today. Uh, I, I remember my association with uh, Honeycomb and uh, Photostop uh, goes on uh, since 2017, uh, the time when we had gone to Masai Mara. And post which we had an exhibition in Bangalore, and Honeycomb was uh, our uh, Honeycomb Art Gallery was our venue, and subsequently, so like we had taken the print uh, at Honeycomb only, and since then, I think all my uh, wildlife uh, photograph prints have been at Honeycomb only. So thank you so much, Nofal sir, for, yeah, for uh, being there at the time of thank the meet. Yeah. And uh, the print quality is second to none. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you and. Uh, 
to, to my uh, wildlife friends uh, please remember we are going to make it an interactive session we are going to have a fun filled learning session and we are we are trying to make it as informal as as pos possible so that uh, you learn it in a simple and easy manner so i have requested the panelists uh, to probably avoid using non technical terms uh, as much as far as possible and uh, hopefully we'll have a great learning session now uh, in my last 11 years uh, when i started with uh, wildlife photography uh, at that point of time the the kind of learning that i had was all by myself there is a very popular saying which says wildlife photo photography is about spoiling your first 10000 images now friends let me be very very honest with you i have not spoiled 10000 i would have spoiled 50000 of my images i am still spoiling it good news is, is that i am still learning it i have learned the hard way not many were there to help and guide initially but later on so like as i started improving i and as i started asking i am being very candid with you as and when i started asking people for help i realized that people are people are good people are ready to help people are ready to guide and so like one of the mentors is there along with me whom i popularly call as guruji uh, it's my it's my privilege and honor uh, to welcome one of one of the person uh, who has been a great inspiration for me who has taught me wildlife photography and who still tends to guide whenever i post an image if he doesn't like it he's the first person to call me up he he doesn't mention it on the social media he calls me up and he says uh jitu i did not like this and if you can just uh, reedit it like this or compose it in this particular manner he would probably do that composition send it across to me and the person that i'm referring to is uh mon thomas sir mon thomas sir thank you so very much for honoring us with your presence uh, looking forward to great learning and inspiration from your side trust trust me friends he is the best and the most humblest person that i have ever come across in this fraternity wildlife where people do don't re actually really come forward not many would come forward to help he is always my go to person i always reach out to him to ask for help guidance and he has this particular attitude of never say no to anyone so friends after after the session also uh, gets over if you feel that so like there are questions to be asked please after the session also you can reach out to him he'll be always there so uh, mon sir uh, i'll i'll just i know so like it would take hours together to introduce you but so like i'll make the introduction very brief for for all the photographers okay. uh, mon thomas sir is a wildlife and nature nature photographer he is a nikon creator he is a nikon expert and he is a nps member that is a nikon professional service member he is a president for a noble organization called as pix for cause pix for cause is a group where top photographers are the members they share the pictures and the pictures are uh, sold for a cause and all the money the, that that we generate to this pix for cause is used for the welfare of the foot soldiers and uh, people who are associated associated with various parks and already during uh, covid times a lot of good work a lot of charity amount worth 12 lakh rupees was uh, spent for the uh, welfare of the people who are working for the wildlife and mon sir is a president for it so it was it was great initiative mon sir thank thank you so much for that and mon sir is also the co-founder for proview uh, nature and uh, wildlife uh, photography uh, this uh, proview uh, does uh, interactive video training sessions and uh, it's a youtube channel please do go go through it it's called as pro view it's a youtube channel you will have great learning on this particular forum too mon thomas sir uh, is a civil engineer by profession wildlife photo photography is his uh, relentless passion that he has been pursuing for the last 23 years he has traveled around the world he is a nikon expert nikon influencer and so like uh, mon sir is a winner of innumerable number of awards uh, the list is endless so but i'll make it very very brief uh, he is a recipient of muthukulam uh, raghavan pillai award in the year 2015 2016 15 and 16 he has won the dcp photographer of the year award uh, he is a fiap uh, biennial world cup uh, gold medalist and as i said the list goes endless mohan sir is has stopped in the, for the last few years is not participating in uh, awards and uh, contests he is now invited as guest or the judge 
uh, took uh, great various events and he is is on the panel of many uh, judging judging for wildlife photography thank you mon sir i welcome thank you humble it's a privilege to, uh, to be here for this particular event it's my it's an honor sir yeah. it's an honor and looking forward to a great interactive session uh, the next panel member uh, i would say he he is he is a person who is very soft spoken he he does not talk limelight he is he i would call i'm not a negative parlance but i would call him a silent killer who goes about doing his business uh, he clicks pictures right if if you want to know the meaning of the word never judge a book by its cover i think one must follow masood hussain masood hussain is a renowned bird photographer uh, his favorite subjects are the raptors and he has been fascinated with wildlife since his childhood days and uh, he wanted to become a wildlife photographer and way since two, 2009 uh, he, he has started using his first dslr camera and the journey has been never ending since then and uh, he started uh, as an uh, amateur photographer but now he is is a guy he is a guiding light he is an idol for most of the bird photographers they approach him they ask him for tips and if somebody wants wants to understand that uh, you do not need high end equipments to make a masterpiece you should look forward to mr masood hussain masood hussain is a recipient of many an awards uh, the some renowned ones have been he has been awarded the best uh, bird photographer by united nations cop 11 held in hyderabad he is the winner of the best wildlife uh, photographer in the bird category and so like he is also the most important one uh, was he is a natural capital award uh, he has been winner of the natural Cap- capital award In the year 2017 by yes bank where the cash prize was 5 lakh rupees and this was in the year 2017 and the most acclaimed uh, the oscar of wildlife photography he he has uh, been recognized he has been given a special mention by naturalist museum uh, for one of his pictures i hope to see that picture today even uh, masood bhai so would love to see that image thank you so much masood bhai for uh, agreeing to be a part of this particular event i look forward to a wonderful session thank you so much jitu bhai that was too generous of you to appreciate thank you very much it's a privilege it's it's, it's an honor to have you with us uh, masood bhai the third person whom i have been working very closely uh, in my uh, the recent coffee table book for my recent coffee table book to be precise uh, uh, which i was doing for paints tiger reserve i had the i would say candid uh, up close and personal interaction with mr uday hegde Mr. Uday Hegde is is a, a wildlife photographer. Specifically in macro photography, I have seen him to be one of the best and go-to uh, photographer. Uday Hegde is a software architect by profession. He is a trained herpetologist. Uh, he does a lot of uh, photography work in the macro, but not only in macro, but uh, in landscape and other wildlife category also. Uh, Uday is an expert. He lives in Bangalore, India. He is a trained herp- herpetologist, as I said earlier. His keen interest is in macro photography, shooting reptiles, amphibians, and insects. Over a period of time, he, he has uh, mastered working with mul- multiple lights, and one can learn a lot from him with his experience and knowledge and uh, through his podcast, podcast too. So, Uday Bhai, uh, I had the privilege of learning under you uh, for the, while working for Paints Tiger Reserve's Copytable book. i uh, would love to learn further and i'm sure that the audience will have a great learning on macro photography by listening to you thank you so much uday bhai and uh, welcome for the session uh, thanks to you bhai it it's really uh, my my privilege to have all of you here it, it is said about wildlife photography that wildlife photography just takes a few days to learn a few days to learn but years to master and i think our masters over here the three panelists have have spent years together over there uh, on field and they say wildlife photography is about uh, trembling hands and uh, stumbling knees so i'm really happy uh, that we have gone through those stages and we are not yet over we are not done and the learning is still on i would love to hear from you just to start with what does wildlife photography mean to you right they say picture is not made on field picture picture is made in your mind you visualize an image and then you click the image they say there is a difference between clicking the picture and making a picture what's your opinion on this 
I, I, I would ask any of the panel member to start with this. The difference between clicking an image and making an image. They say wildlife photography is all about visualizing your image and then clicking it on field. What's your opinion about this? Anybody can go, the, the, any of the panelists. See, in wildlife photography, most of us, we go there with a the camera, what we, what we uh, see, we click. Okay, true. As you get more and more experience, and once you are that initial uh, craze for seeing a, a tiger or a leopard is over, mm -hmm. then that comes a time when you will, when you are going to a park regularly. See, I am a regular visitor to Corbett. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I go on the trip, I yes, I want an elephant here this way. Or I want a tiger here this way. And we repeated if we there, wait there for that uh, that image which you have visualized in your mind. Okay. That is what I would say we make an image. The other is okay. what you get. Okay. So you you would have pre-visualized in this particular light and this way, you, this is the subject you want. That is how you make a image. Over okay, Monsa, I, I would like to ask you one thing. Uh, one of your dream, dream image, or can you can you think of an image that took not days, not weeks, but months or years for you to get? You have been repeatedly going and finally you got it. Can you think of such an image? See, you two are a regular visitor to uh, the Kala. Yeah, Corbett, yes. yeah. The first thing you think of is Ramgan a tiger Ramgan. in that uh, power pool with a reflection yeah. looking at you Good. in golden light, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's a dream frame. Photographers die, die, die to get the tiger there. Or a very good tusker there in the evening light in the uh, grassland area against the setting sun. Wow. These are all the things which is there in your mind you want to achieve. Okay. And how successful you have been, Mohan, sir, in, uh, in making those images? I have to, to an extent, yes. I have not everything. No, okay. in photography, no, you cannot uh, get everything that you want. No way you will get Ab it. Absolutely. There is saying which says, if you ask any of the uh, top photographer, uh, what is the best image that you have clicked? They'll say the one I'm going to click it tomorrow. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> the other thing is a photographer can never be satisfied. Perfect. Perfect. So it's, it's an endless journey, but it's yes. a journey towards self-improvement, which happens day in, day out. Am I right, sir? Yes, sir. And very particularly, that improvement is against your own image. Don't make it a competition or a rivalry okay. <laughs> a, a kind of thing. You try to improve yourself. Okay. So uh, your competition is with yourself, not with someone else. No. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this part of so like uh, comparison of image a little later. But uh, Masood Bhai, What's your opinion about uh, clicking an image and making making an image? Uh, what I feel is, like like Mohan sir said, we we go out on the field and we try to do our best. And you know, if you are visiting a bird park or, or a national park for a tiger, then you know we we pre visualize uh, certain images that you know True. we would love to click. Although mm -hmm. there are many factors which have to come into place, some are control under our control, some are some we cannot control. But it is about making the best out of uh, you know uh, what is there in the situation. But I feel uh, the difference between clicking and making an image is where a human thought has entered, basically an idea which you have and you have implemented while clicking a particular situation which is there in front of you i would say that is making an image there are there are there are many things that just happen in front of you and you happen to click them 
So that, that, that I would say is clicking or documenting. Uh, some of us get lucky to witness uh, some of the best his natural history museum, uh, history uh, moments in the wild. But then there are situations where uh, there is something going on and you think differently. You put an idea, you imagine something and you know, there, there is a human uh, element to it. When, when okay. the thought process goes into it, I would say uh, you're making an image. Okay. I, I would ask you uh, one thing, Masudai. So like, is there an image in mind that you currently are thinking or conceiving that you would be very happy if you get this image? And I'm specifically asking in bird category. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. I, I, like, like you earlier said that uh, the best photographs are yet to come. Yet uh, to come. And, uh, I, like, I can help you. Uh, Masood, a golden eagle flying with a red fox in its leg. Don't you think yeah, that is your dream? <laughs> Wishful thinking, sir. But what what uh, comes to my mind uh, when 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 uh, you have uh, said that uh, you know making an image is uh, it's of course not a bird image. I had uh, uh, shot a bat in flight in in its natural habitat. Uh, it was my first attempt uh, at uh, doing something uh, differently. Uh, so the entire process of it, uh, the technical planning uh, before. I know fruit bat. Am I right? Is it the fruit bat image? So it was a Snyder's leaf-nosed bat. Uh, we had shot okay. in Isaac, and oh. uh, uh, we, we we knew the habitat and all. And reaching there, the entire planning that went around it, uh, the setup, and the, the sensors, the 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 metering, everything had to be very very uh, calculative and. Uh, uh, it, it was it was too much of an adventure, uh, and then getting the shot right uh, was, mm -hmm. was really blissful. Uh, you know, this is this was something I, I remember. I can call making an image. Superb. And uh, how 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 long did it take for you to get that one image? The planning had started about uh, a month earlier. Uh, you know, before the trip, and mm -hmm. uh, then. On the on on the field, it took about mm -hmm. three days. It took about three uh, days, three full days. We were at the site, and you know, uh, learning from our mistakes, making mistakes, then rectifying them, and and trying uh, going for another shot. And so, uh, you know, zeroing in on the on the on the right shot took about three days. Okay, so uh, you would have got some shots. You were not happy, and you waited till you till you got the picture perfect shot. Am I right? That's right. Okay, That's right. so. You are happy that you made that image, am I right? So that image would be close to your heart. Very close to my heart, and and I can I, I remember I, I will cherish that uh, that entire uh, uh, trip and and uh, and the planning that went into it, and the entire experience was very very beautiful and memorable. Superb, superb. Uday Bhai, coming to you, especially <laughs> since now you are the king of macro. <laughs> uh, is, is it different from the other subjects like monster clicks? Uh, most of the time, mammals. Masood by majority of the time he clicks birds and since you are into macro photography so do you think it's a little different visualization making of an image perceiving con conceiving the image in your mind and then executing it on the ground do you yeah, do that I, yeah i would not say that it's completely different but i would say uh, we macro photographers will be more uh, i would say like uh, kind of lucky when it comes to subject right so for example like bird and mammal right so they you have very limited options when when you are clicking them or like because you can't control most of the things but mm -hmm. when it comes to macro photography i have a little edge over both of them because like a uh, few things which will be in my control because like unless i disturb the subject so they will give me sufficient time and i can plan my shots uh, to uh, mm -hmm. to a great extent okay so that's why i think uh, i'm i'm a bit lucky for that matter or any micro photographer i would say so uh, see i will for when you are making an image right when you say making an image so the thing is like as of today what i feel is like camera is becoming more and more intelligent day by day right like your camera right. is doing most of the things so as a photographer, what I bring to table is my creativity or my thought process in that image. So if, if you can put your signature without literally, I'm not in a, in a literal meaning. 
so mm-hmm. the way you shoot right like by by that like if you can create the signature shot anyone can see your image and tell that okay this might be belongs to this person so without without seeing your real signature i think those kind of things what it makes difference like as a photographer so if i i think like i can show you a couple of images which yeah please uh, yeah which will give you a kind of idea from that so just let me know once you can see it yeah okay you can go full screen yeah i will go full screen just give me a second yeah so see this i would say that this is an uh, galaxy frog which is found somewhere in kerala so it's a kind mm-hmm. of very rare frog to see but this okay. image is a properly lit normal image so i would say that this is a clicked image okay this is not a made image okay. so here image, here okay. you don't you don't really see anything which is saying that like uh, i did uh, my part or like for example like i put a lot of thought thought process in creating this image okay mm-hmm. so so the thing is there is a next image so the subject might be pretty simple so here there is a thought process which went behind this image that like i had to wait for several minutes to get the sun right or like wait for the mm-hmm. exact uh, moment to create that image okay so so if you see this this image i think like i had to wait for almost like uh, uh 50 55 minutes sitting in exactly one position without moving even an inch okay so with all the setup ready and uh, then just i just got one shot of this after waiting for 45 or 50 minutes i just got one shot of it so this was a pre planned image where i need the frog and like uh, without disturbing the frog how how i can wait for such a long time so these things will make the difference like how you plan your images so i think like uh, that's what makes the image for me okay beautiful beautiful absolutely incredible so like i i think that that's a great input so like uh, all the, all the panelists agree that there is a difference between clicking image and making image or ordinary photographers click image but uh, people who are experts are the ones who wait uh, whether you are clicking a mammal or a bird or even the small macro subjects like frogs or uh, any other species i i still remember uh, we had clicked uh, mushrooms for for paint and i rem- and i remember it took three long days for us to visualize the sense like go wait for the right light or create light and i know so like i was holding the torch and so like i know how my legs were paining that day so i i know the kind of pain that it goes to to create one image uh, looks very simple macro photography but trust me it, it's it's not everyone's cup of tea but so like here the tips that uh, i i think uh, all our panelists one thing in common that that they have given is if you want to go to the next level please visualize the image conceive that image and wait for that image and as as we have seen what masood bhai also said so like it took three long days three full days just to click one bat image right and whereas in many a times when sometimes we go for mammal in three days we have got more than 3000 pictures so it's not about the number of pictures you click but that one picture is it standing out is it cutting through the clutter and is it uh, the one that which gives you the highest level of satisfaction that yeah i made it i clicked it right so i would i would encourage all, all the wildlife photographers to visualize conceive perceive and then make it happen so i think that's a key so before we go to the next question so like uh, there is a poll question uh, coming up for the audience uh, uh, can we have the poll question please uh, we'll take a minute for this poll question so that we want we wanted to know uh, what you are going through so there is a poll question coming up for the audience uh, please if you if you can just answer this question that would be great it would it would take no more than 1 minute can we have the poll question please
All right, we'll probably almost uh, time that we'll end the poll now. So uh, I, th I think I think that that that's that's really innovative to see that almost uh, fifty five percent of the photographers have not attended any workshop. Now, this is where uh, I would suggest the importance of attending workshops. Now, there are a lot of workshops that are being organized. Fifty six percent of them have not have not attended workshop. Now, please understand, there's a saying, people who want to go to the next level, there's a very popular saying which says, people who want to go to the next level, spend time with others who are better than them. So friends, I encourage you, I literally urge you to start attending workshops. Please understand, not every workshop is paid. You can learn from experts, you can learn from people who are better than you. There is a saying, if you want to go to the next level, spend time with people better than you. It's like it, it doesn't take much time. One hour, if you see the best time in the world is the time that you invest in yourself. Invest time in yourself. You go to the next level. Your photography improves. People recognize it. And so like there is a saying, respect is not given. Respect is earned. And how do we earn respect? With the kind of work that we do, the kind of things that we produce. So I literally urge you to please uh, attend as many workshops as far as possible. Take out time. See, I know we all have 24 hours. We are, I have not stopped learning. I, I would also request you not to stop learning. And the only way we can keep learning and keep growing is by attending workshops like these. So please do attend workshops, right? So it's, it's a, just a simple, humble request. All right, friends. So let's let's go ahead with, Paul, uh, with, uh, with uh, our second question. And uh, since we spoke about wildlife photography, uh, I'm going to ask all, all my good friends over here, uh, can you talk about your favorite camera setting and your preferred mode for shooting? This is one of the common questions that I felt whenever I'm on field, many people come and ask me, uh, Jitubai, what mode do you use? Uh, for a long, long time, without any second thought, without any hesitation, I'm saying, for a long, long time, I used to shoot in aperture priority. It was more like, no. Uh, uh, can we have the poll a little, little later, please? Can we have the poll a little later? Okay. Acha. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. Let, let's, uh, since the question is already up, uh, let's have this question. Which is your preferred mode for clicking wildlife? Which mode? Whether you're doing macro, whether you're doing birding, whether you're doing uh, even select like zoo photography. Now, my, my, as I said, for a long, long time, I used to use aperture priority. So which mode do you use to click wildlife today? I request, uh, I urge, I request all of you to just quickly take this poll so that we have a better understanding of what mode are you using. All right, perfect. So it's, it's, a, it's a surprising uh, result that I see over there. Forty-five percent of the forty-six percent of the people are using manual mode. That means you are already at the level next. Uh, Seventeen percent people are using auto mode. Uh, Twenty-eight percent are with aperture priority, and only nine percent with shutter priority. So forty-six percent are with manual mode. I remember. For the first 10 years, for the first two years, it was auto mode. Next eight years, it, it was aperture priority for me. And it was only last year. Trust me, I'm not uh, joking. But it was only the last year that I went into manual mode because I had a preconceived notion that manual mode is difficult. Right? Too, too many changes. And especially since I do tiger photography, I would have very little time to play with the settings. So that's the reason why I said, why take a risk on field? That's why my favorite go-to mode was aperture priority mode. So let's now listen from the experts and let's find out 
is there any favorite mode of theirs and why do they prefer using that particular mode what's your favorite uh, panelist what's your favorite camera setting it's more like you bring it back to zero so that is more like base setting what's your base setting if you if somebody picks up the camera what's the setting you know what what settings you have kept it so what's your favorite setting and what's your favorite mode uh, can we start with masood bhai for first year uh, yeah so uh, th this is uh, uh, actually uh, a very common and a wonderful question indeed and uh, i always uh, uh, try to answer this one differently and and mostly uh, guiding it towards intermediates or beginners see uh, there is nothing right or wrong here firstly i would like to give out a disclaimer that whatever i'm saying is my personal uh, opinion and that i mean that using any other setting or any other mode is wrong everything is right until it works out for you so uh, ultimately it has it boils down to what you are comfortable with and what you're doing uh, you know what what you have in mind personally my uh, favorite mode has always been uh, aperture priority mode and uh, it, this one surprises a lot of people because uh, you know birds being my favorite subject they are very quick moving and you know i, I sometimes aim for take off shots and birds in flight and also shutter should have been my priority is what people think but uh, why i go with aperture priority mode is again here the, the reason is, is 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 totally dependent on my personal preference and my equipment so what i do is i am i have till date not used any of those bazookas lenses my gear has been very moderate and uh, so i'm talking about you know uh, the prosumer lenses which i've been using uh, most of the time so these lenses uh, because you don't pay much for it you don't get much out of them <laughs> to, to be very honest so all these lenses have a sweet aperture where they where they are at the, the their performing best so this aperture happens to be a couple of stops you know down the the maximum aperture of the lens for example if i am using a, a nikkor uh, 200 to 500 mm uh, 7.1 so 7.1 is is where it it is the sharpest so i don't want to miss out the the best part performing part of my lens so i know it is it is performing best at it, it is the sharpest at f7.1 so i would want to lock my aperture there firstly now the second thing that comes in uh, in the picture is you know uh, what about the shutter speed so the only thing which i have my eye on while i'm shooting is my sh my aperture is locked because i don't want any other aperture as my lens is performing best at that aperture it is the sharpest there so i'll keep that constant and i keep an eye on the shutter speed depending on the available light it keeps varying and i just keep a very constant eye if my shutter speed is falling below what i want i quickly raise my iso to compensate for that so ultimately i have only one parameter which i am worried about it is the iso i'm i'm constantly looking at the shutter speed and changing my iso depending on what kind of shutter speed i want so this keeps things very simple and uh, you know uh, if 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 the subject is is giving me more time i i get my first initial shots like this this is my base setting like uh, professor said and from here on i start experimenting this is where i start and then if the subject is cooperative and if i am getting a lot of time with it then i might switch over to manual mode and do some experiments basically if i if i want and if i suddenly want to you know create a, a, a low key uh, image out of it so i would you know probably go on to manual mode use spot filtering and heavily under expose the background and and you know create a, a, a low key kind of an image so changing the mode comes next for me uh, and my favorite has always been uh, you know uh, aperture priority mode it is safe to start with that is my base set perfect udhay bhai how about your your preferences especially since yes. most of the time you go in damp condition whether it's especially monsoon seasons and all do you have a different setting altogether uh yeah kind of so what what masood bhai told is absolutely true so the thing is like there is no right or wrong so it's all comes to your what you are comfortable with 
So I I never used uh, auto mode. So there are some technical reasons for that. So if you want to uh, go in depth, so the for example, like if you consider a meter for which is from minus three to plus three and zero being the middle. So when you put your camera to auto uh, mode, what will happen is the camera's intelligence or the the algorithm what is written on. So it may go to like the extent of minus one to plus one. Your camera mm -hmm. will not decide based on the, the conditions. It will not go beyond that because there is a limitation to that. So, but when you are controlling your aperture or shutter speed or ISO, so you can reach minus three to plus three. Any anything between this value, right? So the thing is mm -hmm. the, the amazing images or something which is uh, extremely good will come sometime somewhere between uh, minus 2.5 to plus 2.5, that range. So that's why camera itself will not go to that extent. So that's why you need to use the creative modes where either it's aperture or manual or shed priority. So I prefer uh, manual, sorry, uh, aperture priority mode for the natural light shots, even for the macro. So, but when I'm using uh, artificial lights like flash or uh, or any other lights like torches, all these things, so I go with uh, manual mode. So, what happens is like I get the freedom of like overpowering the flash and underexposing the image to the great extent and um, varying the shutter speed and then because you have some limitations on the shutter speed uh, on a normal flash so unless you have a high speed sync so for all these things i use manual mode uh, for the shed, uh, the images which i shoot with uh, artificial light and i use aperture priority mode for the uh, all other shots brilliant so uh, you're you're mostly so like as, as rightly said so like when you're using flash it is uh, manual exactly, exactly. In, the, in the in the normal scenario you yeah. use you will you will see my camera with 400 iso by default and like aperture somewhere between 5.6 to f8 so if i'm shooting macro it will be between f8 and f11 so if it is something else it will be maybe 5.6 or 500 mm or 7200 that's how brilliant. you see my camera yeah. brilliant <laughs> perfect Mohan sir. Jitu sir, your question was, your camera is a new or set to zero. What will you be your setting, right? Yeah. So, suppose I pick up Mohan sir's camera. Now, there is a subject and so like I'm, I'm, I'm clicking. So, Mohan sir knows that, okay, his settings are set to this. Is it that way? Yes. See, me, uh, as, uh, see uh, first thing, if I take a new body, things mm -hmm. which I set is the quality i shoot only raw no, no only raw mm -hmm. number two i uh, i'll shoot as um, Masubai, i shoot and i will advise to shoot wildlife in apache priority okay apache priority then kelvin i will shoot at kelvin at k at required white balance so your 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 main setting Kelvin is uh, five thousand or five thousand five hundred. Depends, you know. If it is uh, day daylight, it can be four eight to five. Four eight okay. to five thousand. Okay. If it is uh, as the light goes, it can go uh, go to five thousand five hundred. Can go to six thousand also. So if it is very okay. dark, uh, for instance, I have shot a uh, uh, tiger at nine thousand uh, Kelvin also. Because it was okay. very dark. Okay. So uh, my uh, settings so, would be, I will start, my camera will be set at f5.6. Mm -hmm. Because uh, wildlife, most of the time, the light will not be sufficient. Okay. So to be ready, I'll keep it at 5.6. My okay. exposure compensation usually will be at zero. Okay. These are my settings. Anything else you want to know? Perfect. So, uh, my point also is, once you have shot, yeah. do you bring it back to zero? Or do you bring it back? Most of the time, it so happens. Like, for example, we have shot we have shot an image at high ISO. You have evening evening time, 8,000. Yes, you have, you have yes I will then, definitely. And one more is the metering will be always... 95% of the time it is uh, evaluating. 
evaluative metering and okay so you you click more mostly on evaluative metering yes okay uh, perfect so now since we have started talking about metering and all uh, let's talk about like there are three basic elements every good photograph is said to have three basic elements they are composition light and the moment the moment that is uh, is it a storytelling image the the moment is it like for example a rare moment that you have captured so a a good image has three elements composition light and the moment can you please share some tips about composition see moment yes it's some people call it as luck so by by chance by luck you were there so at if you are there at the right moment at the right place it's a matter of luck but i'm talking about the other two important elements that is composition and light how important are they and how do you understand the different types of lights that are there now we see there are three different types of light uh, uh, front lit back lit and then so like we have got some images which are top lit right so how do you manage this different lighting conditions and how do you use your exposure compensation or a white balance or a metering to compensate this natural light in clicking your desired image so my question is on composition and lighting how do you manage those and how do you compensate with the natural light that is there whether it is a back lit front lit or a side lit now i am sure uh, we have got three different genres of phot photography mons or does mammals mostly uh, masood bhai uh, does birding mostly and uh, uday bhai does macro so is there lighting conditions different requirement different for different uh, different genres is it same composition is it different that's what i wanted to know can 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 we can we start with uh, mon sir would you like to take initiative yes, on this yes please i will i will show you how i will use light for my uh photography yeah see this is an image which i have clicked uh, in corbett in natural mm -hmm. light wow well, i've used a... i've not used any uh, i just managed to get a, a natural light this is how i could get an image of a tiger there in uh, corbett okay brilliant brilliant so this is the natural light so there That's is no added light. light and nothing nothing see this is an oh. early mo misty morning in kana barasinga barasinga so a backlit image early morning mist this is how uh, i was able to make an image out of this The, the the light adds value to the image isn't it yes definitely Completely again embara singa from uh, uh, kana early morning misty morning so super you need to make use of the available light in uh, wild life uh, very seldom you get to uh your subject in good light uh so you need to make use of the light to make your image brilliant brilliant one sir masu bhai yes it bhai so uh this uh, uh this aspect is uh, basically uh, more to do with the <clears throat> the the making of mammals the okay whether it is birds or mammals see uh, the the best part the most challenging part of wildlife photography whether it is uh, uh, any genre whether it is mammals or birds uh, the most challenging part is there's nothing in your control uh, true sub the subject of course you can't control yes and uh, 
again like you said if it if it is a natural history moment you got to be lucky that it is happening in front of you true other than this if you if you are trying to click a scene in front of you uh what what my opinion has you know over the past few years i've i've uh, been learning from my own mistakes from a lot of sources a lot of teachers a lot of experienced uh, more experienced photographers uh it it all boils down to how you think in a particular particular situation and how how you would take advantage of whatever is available in front of you for example i will i will uh, uh, you know i i personally uh, you know prefer when i when i shoot a bird i personally prefer darker backgrounds so that you know my subject pops out uh so how how it's it's not about how you set your camera it's 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 irrelevant what mode you are using right now so it i been, i don't want to go into too much of technicalities here because it is actually easy i i want to mm-hmm. make it sound easy now okay. i i have a base mode in 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 place i'm using aperture priority my aperture is set to f7.1 now i'm only looking at my shutter speed and just changing my isos uh, uh, you know to get the required shutter speed now if if i change my position like for example there's a bird sitting on a perch and i want a low key image of it i i first take the shot whatever i'm getting i first click it that is where your improvisation starts your first shot okay and then the bird is still there and and you have a little more time to do some experiments you quickly you know analyze what's going on what the light is from where it is hitting the subject and like if i go with my preference to make a low key image i would certainly want myself to be in such a position that the background of the bird is darker naturally okay. i i would probably move a little bit here and there and see if i can have some shade behind it it okay. could be a tree trunk trunk in the background or it could be a you know a, a canopy in the background where you know if i just mm-hmm. change my position and then get that into uh, picture mm-hmm. and then a little bit of under exposure will further darken the background and mm-hmm. subject pops out that is how the low key uh, imaging is done so uh, i would like to uh, show some uh, image please share screen yeah i'm sharing screen uh, i hope my screen is visible no share desktop you have to press share screen and share desktop i think uh, there's some issue here i think uh, uh, i'll i'll uh, i'll take it up uh, uh, after rode maybe i'll i'll just uh, yeah 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 please rode bhai what's your perspective on the composition and the lights and all yeah yeah so jit bhai i think uh, i will show few images i think and then Talking yeah, will be you, easy you for can, me. You can you can talk by showing the images. Yeah, exactly, exactly. That's what I'm planning. So let me know once you can see it. I'm able to see it. Okay, great. Okay, so let's first when it comes to the lighting, right? So we spoke about the three different lighting: the front lit, back lit, and side lit. All this. Side lit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So and sometimes like it's it's exactly what exactly you want to uh, show it. in the final image so based on that at least on the macro so i mm-hmm. would i always go with the get the with the few things like what will be the my final image okay so if mm-hmm. i want to show an close up or a portrait kind of thing 
uh, of of a snake or an insect. So I definitely would like to go with the front lit image where the the subject is completely lit and the proper color uh, is is shown in the image. So you can see this image. So what is visible on the screen? So this is the proper front lit image with an with an proper uh, lighting and the diffused lighting. So Beautiful. yeah. So the second image, what you are seeing here, this is a side lit image. Okay. So this right. was shot with a natural light. Okay. So the light was exactly early morning light was falling on that uh, uh, the the banana leaf. So the frog was inside. So I just wanted to show the the swell kind of uh, uh, patterns which is there in the in the uh, the leaf. So if you use front lit on this point or on this image, so the the lighting is so uh, like I would say subtle or like and flat, so that you will not be able to see this this circles, right? So the shadow and the highlight is, is very much important here. So that's why it, it all depends on the image or the subject what you are shooting. So if you say, talk about the backlit, so these sure. two images what you are seeing here, these are all proper backlit images. Okay. So uh, when it comes to backlit, I prefer the subjects which are uh, most of a translucent or uh, transparent kind of subjects which uh, would love. Uh, like really look great in the backlit images. So that's mm. how I choose the the backlit or frontlit or side lit in most of the cases. And when it comes to composition, so uh, so for me composition is everything. Okay, so the thing is like what whether it is rule of third or like there are multiple multiple ones, right? So I would say first you learn the composition, then you are you are free to break it. Okay, there is no standard True. rule that you should follow something but like when you want to break something you should know how to use it so when you when you are mastering the actual composition rules then you are free to break it and then it's it's okay to break it so this one you can see that there's a natural backlight image and uh, so the composition is like i i really love the the semicircle here and coming the the downwards one so uh, what I say for macro photographers, so the best light is always natural light. So if you can learn how to play with natural light in a best possible way, so then you can control any any light uh, however you want. So the thing is like uh, the easiest way today's macro photographers, most of them use a flash and a diffuser and then just start shooting. So but the thing is what will happen is like when you when you... Uh, go to the next level so until and unless you are mastering the natural light it's it's very difficult to create something unique uh, in in your image okay so the image which you are seeing on the left hand side is a natural light image where the the light is passing through the body of an uh, yellow bellied cat snake so you can see mm -hmm. the underbelly and the heart and other other internal organs so on the right hand side it's a simple image like i i really love to play with lines so so that's how like you don't really have to show the complete subject to uh, absolutely <laughs> right so i i always love to play with lines and uh, light and shadow so this was shot with just single torch light okay so the one what you're seeing on the right hand side is one single torch light and on from the top top angle so that's how the image is created here so and the composition right like i was talking about composition awesome. so mm -hmm. so you should know what to include and what to exclude when you are shooting something like this praying mantis might look very ordinary if i don't include those leaves right so the leaves is what creating the image rather than the praying mantis so it's as as a photographer i think like we should we all should learn what exactly you need to include in an image and what should be excluded as part of that image so this what uh, makes a great image according to me superb superb i think i think that's a valuable point as a photographer when you're composing image you should know what to include and what not to include exactly i think i i, I think uh, and uh, i really appreciate your suggestion and the input that wherever possible try to use natural light even yeah. in macro i thought yeah. macro was all about using artificial light and also i think <laughs> this particular uh, uh, I think mindset has to change that macro is not only about uh, using torches and external light, but yeah. great photographs can be made even during natural uh, with the use of natural light. 
extremely valuable input udhay bhai thank you so very much masood bhai uh, would uh, now now you are ready to sh- showcase your images brilliant Uh, is it visible now awesome yeah. so uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, lighting i was talking about when uh, this is uh, a, a dark background basically there was a canopy behind the shot it's a, it's a very simple shot uh, uh, it's it's early morning and and the light is selectively falling on the subject and i haven't changed any modes here i'm i'm still in aperture priority and i have underexposed the shot by maybe about one stop and that has thrown the background further into darkness and the subject is popping up so this is kind of a low key image here another similar image is this one very selective light falling on the subject there's there's not too much of technicality involved this mostly my base settings and i have only underexposed uh, exposure compensation has uh, is is somewhere around uh, minus 1 here and and this is the opposite basically this is again a very simple shot uh, portrait of a pelican uh, now like i said uh, it it all depends on what situation you are in so this shot i think was taken somewhere uh, in pulikat i guess maybe and uh, we had almost we were almost done with our, uh, our morning session the light had become very harsh and the light was now reflecting off the water surface so instead of just not taking any shot because you're not going anyways bag you you're spending time there to for, for the light to go down so you could uh, as well use the excess light to your favor get a little creative overexpose it and you know uh, make a, a high key image uh, white on white background like this so this is how the thinking goes uh, in, into you know making an image or or uh, you know uh, giving it a thought of how to get a little different or or make the best out of uh, you know the available resources there uh, i would also like to show a couple of more images which are which were shot on the same day at, at the same place so this is uh, this one is basically uh, a kalish present a very simple shot uh, i i just converted into black and white for 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 some for some reason but uh, it it is uh, ambient light nothing much has gone into it it is simple aperture priority mode f7.1 like my base setting goes and the same shot at a different time of the day uh, you know uh, the the light the direction of the light had changed and then i try to get a little creative with the same bird here and this is what it is so now the the the, the light is from behind it is giving a rim light effect and uh, without doing many many changes in 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 the camera or uh, anything it is just about thinking and you can get a little creative and that that is what exactly i want to highlight here for for all the beginners or intermediates who are listening to me uh the cameras can do a lot these days they have multiple features which you might not even use in the entire you know time in the entire time the camera is with you you might not be able to actually even explore what your camera and lens is capable of uh, capable of and not much is supposed to be used as well it is basically how you think if you you there are so many workshops there are so many uh, tutorials available online there are there is uh, so many resources to learn but most of them will boil down to this to, to the same thing see aperture shutter speed iso these are the three things you have to primarily control in in almost any camera body you take any make or any level it it will always boil down to how you think you will not majorly go wrong 
that is for sure if if you if you if your basics are a little right you know how these parameters are connected that is enough for you so there there is no particular setting for a particular situation a little uh, uh you know metering might go wrong here and there you cannot be precise all the time but that's okay uh, you will you will just have to ensure that you are not heavily over exposing the shot so that you cannot bring it back to life and you should ensure that your shot is crisp ensure that your shutter is shutter speed is proper and you get a sharp shot because blurry images have no no place whatsoever and unless you are trying to do again something different with uh, uh with slow shutter creative yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Even with the shutter speed is another story altogether so uh photography whether it is bird photography or or any other genre it is not rocket science at all uh yeah the, the technology has advanced you have you have so many uh, options to choose from but those options will only uh, simplify a few things for you but they will not make an image for you ultimately your image will be made by your thought process by the way you think and how quickly you think about getting creative or or making use of uh, the natural elements or whatever the situation is how quickly how creatively you can use i think that is the main uh, uh, point uh, i would want to highlight that will make uh, you a better photographer or or uh, you know you will you will make different images and better looking images that's all from me thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you so much masood bhai you have made complex things sound so very simple uh and i'm sure uh, photography uh, they say uh, don't uh, it's most of the time we who complicate simple things so i think Uh, what you rightly said it's so like uh, stick to the basics uh, get your facts right and then so like experiment and more more often than not you will be able to click your desired image thank you so much for those uh, uh, valuable inputs masood bhai really appreciate it thank you thank you thank you so very much uh, since now we are discussing about light and all so i i thought so like let's stick on to this only so so far we were talking about natural light right now uh, front lid back lid side lid now let's talk about uh, based on the light conditions now let's see what's the role of metering and exposure compensation and very importantly white balance so we'll discuss now about based on the current light conditions see we cannot change the external light conditions i wanted to know what would be the role of metering and exposure compensation and what can we do with white balance to get a desired image right so we'll we'll try to understand that particular aspect uh, can can we can we start with monsa monsa so when we talk about uh, metering there are uh, basically three metering mode one is uh, matrix or uh, that's for canon users and evaluative for nikon users then we have center weighted and we have spot meet uh, spot metering i use 95 more than 95% of the time i use evaluative evaluative metering. metering i know evaluative metering it analyzes the entire frame and exposes for uh the entire frame taking into account the darks and the lighter shades whereas in spot metering the camera analyzes only the spot where it is focusing supposing you are uh, uh, you are uh, focusing on a particular subject see so this is one leopard which i shot at very harsh backlit i tried over exposing uh, one stop two stop still i couldn't get the detail on the leopard so i had to go to spot metering and uh, do a little bit of over exposure along with that to get the detail of this leopard when you are using spot metering please check your shutter speed because when you go to a spot metering your shutter speed will 
drop please have drop. a look at drastically yes and uh, when you talk about white balance i always because when you are uh, when you are uh, doing a trip for a week or so you would have shot one subject in particular light once you get back home and when you sit down for uh, processing uh, processing that image you will not remember you will not remember what was the exact light so my i would suggest that you you capture your frame in the exact uh, color tone as seen there so that's why i always use required white balance for example if i am shooting in daylight it can be 48 to 5000 and if you are shooting in i don't know some of if you are shooting in uh, africa it is some sometime 4000 to 4300 in uh, daylight if it is shade 5500 if it's more darker 6000 so i would recommend you shoot at the required white balance otherwise you will not see especially if you are trying to shoot something like a uh, i'm off uh, wildlife uh, sunset if you if you are not raising a white balance you will i mean very uh, seldom get the actual color so usage of uh, white balance is very vital while shooting is there any other question along with that mon sir i uh, just wanted to ask you in particular like for example uh, for for those who are using kelvin mode so mo most of the people who use kelvin especially like I, since i do tiger uh, tiger, uh, tiger photography most of the time now it's advised that select like, to get the best colors of the tiger using Kelvin mode, 5,000 to 5,500. Yes. Am I right? Now, suppose uh, you have to ha uh, shoot at higher Kelvin. Do you do use manually, manual method to increase the Kelvin or do you go cloudy or select so, like, you use no, the I will, I will go manually, manually. Okay, you'll go manually. Yes. So you had, okay. uh, if I'm not uh, wrong, you had asked me one more question along with this about exposure compensation. Uh, yeah, I'm really sorry. Exposure compensation. So too. I did a very, very costly, very costly mistake. I will show you here. I went all the way to Svalbard to shoot uh, polar bears, polar bears and my first trip. Oh. This was this was the image. Okay. I was good. under the impression, see, uh, light is good. The polar bear is white. Everything is white. I need to underexpose. I need to underexpose. This is shot in mm -hmm. uh, almost daylight. Okay. I need to underexpose. What actually mm -hmm. happened was, since I the camera is already underexposing because of the whites in the frame, I added mm -hmm. uh, uh, further reduce the exposure compensation so and my so it frame turned gray. Uh, Can you see my uh, polar bear is not? Uh, as white now, as it should be. Yeah, now that you have said, so like now I can see slightly it's turning towards gray. See, can you see it here? Mm, right, near its hands, I can see that. So, next year, I had to go back there again, which was quite expensive. After learning that, in this situation, I need to overexpose. So for whites, you overexpose further. Yes. So this is the image. Can you see? Oh, it looks perfect, perfectly white. So this is an image where I've overexposed. By so, by how many stops, sir? Uh, it was point, point, point seven. Point seven. 
Oh, 0.7. Yes. So, you need to use your white balance. You need to use, use your uh, exposure compensation as required. Please don't go wrong on that. Superb. Superb. Incredible. Brilliant, sir. So, I, I think this is a valuable lesson. So, uh, taking cue from here, can I say that, so like, especially when I'm shooting polar bears, if if by any chance, if I go to Antarctica or Svalbard, then, so like, when I'm shooting polar bears, I have to go for plus 0.7. Though I'm clicking a white subject, I have to overexpose. Yes. Am I right? If, if the background also is white, it has white, to be uh, overexposed. Okay. At least don't uh, underexpose. Okay. Never underexpose it. And similarly, uh, if I'm clicking a slot bear, so if I want the blacks to look like black but not gray, so I have to underexpose a slot I would bear. keep it at zero. You would keep it at zero? Yes. You would advise to keep it at zero? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Black panther right, or sir. slot bear, I would shoot at zero. Zero, but yes. but uh, but not uh, below. You're not under no, 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 no. Perfect, perfect. I I think that's a, that's an important lesson. Uh, Uday, bhai, uh, can you can we have you discuss? Sure, 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 sure. Uh, so Ajit, bhai, I think uh, let me share again. So hope you are able to see my screen. Yes. Okay. So uh, so we were talking about sorry, I don't know how it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we were talking about the metering, right? So the initial. Right. So I use Canon Gear. So my camera mm -hmm. is having what like three three different meterings as monster mm -hmm. tool. So it's a evaluative and uh, spot and I think center weighted. Uh, center weighted. Yeah. So I usually switch between uh, two metering modes. So one is evaluative and uh, one is spot metering. So this kind of scenario, what you are seeing. So there's an uh, Albino Cobra, so it is shot mm. somewhere in, in near Thumku. So this kind of scenario, I want my camera to meet the whole frame, mm -hmm. right? Not, not the subject, because there is a sunset which is happening in the background with clouds and clouds are having some different kind of color and all, all different elements are there. So that's why like in this case, like I want my uh, camera to meter the whole frame so that like uh, the my background will not get bleached if i if i use spot metering here the snake might be exactly in uh, in the right exposure but like background will go completely white to compensate that uh, the exposure right so this kind of scenario i use uh, uh, evaluative metering and uh, in in some cases so where i need to make the so this was shot on in cloudy uh, day okay so i mm -hmm. i just took the sky as the background so what happened is it was an overcast day so usually when you are shooting in an overcast day so if you if you just shoot the sky so it come becomes gray so in that case, like what i did is i use the spot metering because like my subject is somewhere around uh, compared to uh, sky it will be two to three stops below okay so below. usually True the subject and the background the sky is almost like three stops above the like or the plur, uh, above the subject so that's why like what i did here is i just took the spot metering and i just uh, uh, took the zero exposure or maybe slightly on the plus side uh, and then i uh, i shot this image so that like the overcast sky which was supposed to be gray became more towards white and my subject became uh, pretty normal like it, it's a properly exposed image so i use these two modes uh, most of the time so it's all depends on the situation there is no hard and fast rule that when, which you need to use and uh, i think like everything depends on what is the final output you want to create so based on that uh, i do that and when it comes to exposure compensation i i use it uh, very frequently because uh, to create something very unique, you might need to use it. For example, like uh, sometimes you overpower the flash and underpower under, or uh, you go towards the minus on the on the exposure compensation, so that like the darker areas will become completely dark, and I think bright area will 
the or the reflective surface will remain reflective i don't know i have that image or not so i don't know maybe i think in instagram yeah i i have it so for example this image if you see this image this is a uh, millipede okay so uh, so what happened is millipede will have the the reflective uh, body so some part of the body will be an uh, shiny body so which reflect the light so what i did here is like i used a flash which is kind of overpowered flash instead of zero i used uh, plus 1 or uh, plus one and a half on the on the flash compensation. So and then I underexpose the image or the or I would not say underexpose. So it's like uh, exposure compensation towards the minus side minus three. So that like the the non-reflective surface will become completely dark because my flash is reflecting only few part of the millipede's body that will be visible. So absolutely, I of... I initially thought it was pearls. <laughs> I think yeah. very creative. Yeah. Very, yeah. very so creative. yeah. So these kind of things, like I think like when you when you want to create something uh, very unique, I think like you'll have to go to the extreme end of the uh, in 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 your camera settings and how you play with that. So these are all the I, I use uh, uh, these things very very frequently in a different way. I would say any photographer for that matter, the very first thing should be uh, to know your camera completely like like how you uh, know your phone most of the people in today's world so everybody knows what their phone can do completely right so even so, even in your dreams you can type messages so <laughs> <laughs> so so but in the same way i think you need to know your camera's capacity like what your camera can do and what is the till where, what level you can push your camera so i think if you if you start learning that i think you can create some great images one wonderful advice i think uh, very importantly it's more like when you're going to the battle or when you're going to the war you must know your equipments you should know yeah. how to use them well right exactly. otherwise like if you're under prepared yeah. there, there is a very popular saying which says a prepared person seldom fails very rarely you will fail if you are very well prepared exactly. so exactly. the whole point i cannot forget one golden rule that one of my friend had said uh, while we were working for the bandhavgarh book he told me have you ever tried switching off your light and playing with the dials and buttons? Suppose you rotate the dial twice or thrice, right? What's yeah. the setting? Do you know what exactly uh, does it read? And yeah. he said, either blindfoldedly or switch off the light of your room and you should know which button is where. And if you have rotated the dial clockwise, anti-clockwise, twice, thrice, you should know exactly what the setting is. And he said, yeah. only if, only when you can do that, you will be able to play around and get some uh, master images. And I have not forgot that learning. Thank you so much, Uday Bhai. Uh, valuable input. And uh, very rightly said, experiment more often to get yeah, great exactly. results. Thank you so much. Thank you. Masood Bhai? Uh, yes, Ito Bhai. Uh, regarding uh, uh, metering, uh, uh, almost always uh, my camera is set to center weighted metering. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no particular reason except that uh, I mostly shoot birds and birds usually occupy a very little area of little the, space. Uh, and uh, why I don't use spot metering at, at uh, initially is uh, that becomes very, very small area for metering. Uh, on mm -hmm. a so center weighted average is a little safe because my subject is small occupying very little space uh, in the frame. So mm -hmm. and there are multiple colors also involved uh, when I'm shooting. True. So it's, it's pretty safe to use the center weighted average when it comes to uh, bird photography. But again, it also depends on uh, you know how close I am uh, to the subject and how how much space it is occupying. Like in mammals, uh, you know, when you're shooting a tiger or an elephant, usually these subjects are bigger. So uh, you can even go with the evaluative and uh, you know spot metering if you're if you're doing a, a particular uh, you're having something in mind. But uh, again, here I would uh, I would uh, want to share uh, uh, with the viewers that um, there's there's no right and wrong here. And if you are at on on a center weighted or on uh, evaluative metering, I don't think even if you if you by mistake take a shot without knowing which metering you've been using, you know, I don't think you will drastically go wrong. So you, you don't have to be scared about it. So uh, if, if, you, if you are trying to achieve a particular result, 
then of course yes you will have to you know uh, meter it accordingly and and these experiments happen only when the subject is with you is is cooperating with you when you have enough time uh, so uh, i don't think it is anything to be scared of and personally uh, my my opinion about white balance uh, i haven't uh, uh, you know i my camera is always set to cloudy i don't know for what but it is there okay. i with it and maybe i i i if i don't like it i i like to get uh, you know if uh, towards the cooler side i usually do it in uh, the post processing so uh, for white balance i haven't been very particular uh, and it hasn't changed much of course the initial look of my image uh, when i when i open it for post processing might look a little you know warmer or towards the cool uh, mostly towards the warmer side because i'm keeping it cloudy So six thousand five hundred, right? I don't like the feel. If I if I want, uh, because I I remember what the scene was. So uh, and you know a little bit of tweaking here and there, bringing back to uh, a little cooler side. I do it in post processing. So uh, again here, uh, basically it is it is it is very simple, and uh, you don't have to worry too much about this unless yes, having knowledge about. Uh, what happens when like like uh, mohan sir has given a wonderful example not many people talk about it uh, about the polar bear he was shooting in swalbard so what what went wrong in in the first place when when he tried to do that is is basically uh, the camera when it starts metering it renders everything gray it understands it as gray and then from gray. it starts metering it so the subject was white on a white background so the the sub the, the camera got tricked and it actually underexposed compensated it underexposed for which sir had to overexpose to to get over to tell the camera ke no this is right this is what i don't underexpose it so this is a very good topic uh, i think uh, mohan sir has brought up a very very nice uh, thing and similarly i would also request uh, uday to uh, to shed a little more light uh, on uh, the manual mode uh, you know, when he uses with flash because a lot of people uh, are, are confused with uh, balancing ambient light with flash light mm -hmm. brilliant brilliant thank you so much masood bhai uh, now uh, i think uh, we have uh, time for one last question so i i would i would love to ask on uh, one very important part of framing and composition framing and composition i'm i'm using relatively so uh, what kind of framing do you follow like uh, as uh, i remember uday bhai just telling uh, the rule of one third first know the rule and then break the rule he he rightly said so now especially like for uh, clicking uh, mammals like for example uh, they say uh, especially now i'm i'm taking cue from tiger photography uh, if if a tiger is walking towards you uh, it is said so like uh, you have to click head on so uh, i i just would like to take take an example and just uh, show one image here uh, i'm showing that uh, in this image for a specific reason i'll i'll just share the reason with you in a minute okay uh this this is one image that i had ma made up in carbet right uh, i i picked up my big uh, lens i click this image in carbet now it was it's a very tight frame it's a 500 mm that i was using and so like when i clicked this particular image it i i was so proud of this image that because i could fit all the three tiger it's an uncropped image and the, it happened like a flash and in the heat of the moment so like i had that uh, mindset that okay my shutter speed should be high everything i had over and spent i'm very very proud of this particular image when i click this image i congratulated myself saying that wow you have made a wonderful image while i was clicking this uh my driver my driver picked up my 7200 while i was clicking this my driver picked up the 7200 and he he made this image while i was shooting that other image with the 500 mm my driver had the presence of mind that he went vertical not only he shot these three tigers running but just see the composition or the framing wherein he included even a sambars on on the on the top left hand corner so i think 
the the visualization and the composition and the framing of the image adds beauty to the image right so again so like uh, it 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 was so like looking at only after looking at this image so like then i thought so like let me also go vertical right if i would have uh, i have used a 7200 for this particular image and i i i got a habitat shot so now taking cue from here i am just uh, asking uh, our esteemed panelist now what is the framing that you recommend uh, portrait mode landscape mode vertical framing like for example they say when the tiger is walking head on you you have to click it in portrait mode or uh, you have to click it in uh, landscape uh, portrait mode my apologies and so like if you want to shoot the habitat and all you have to go it in landscape mohan sir what's your perspective on it portrait landscape framing how would you frame a image see most of the case most of the case when uh, you are shooting a tiger head on when do you go vertical when the tiger comes close when the tiger comes very close absolutely yes. till then you are shooting in horizontal mode right true 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 agreed so uh, even i i do the, do the same thing but regarding uh, composition i would i would strongly recommend to follow the rule of 1/3 okay. not every time you can there can be exception if possible if possible uh, follow a rule of 1/3 that is what i do okay so uh i i i would i would uh, also add on to one more thing uh, because we have shortage of time what's your choice close up or habitat i will share couple of images here please see when you want to when you want to show an expression okay i would go close up mm mm-hmm. see if uh, this is a uh, shot on uh, habitat shot you you might n- that uh, expression, expression might not be absolutely shown this absolutely. way but most cases most cases i love to shoot it with the habitat wow. can you see the this? majestic landscape look True. at that how beautiful it is it shows it conveys a story of a animal uh, with with its natural environment masood bhai sorry i am entering your territory no problem no problem <laughs> <laughs> so just can you just see this image it is almost like yeah. a painting absolutely i was just about to say it, it looks like a painting so i love to shoot uh, with the habitat but there are exceptions uh when the tiger is close or if there is some expressions you want to uh, convey yes you need to shoot in uh, close ups brilliant brilliant see, there's one more incident here see this is a rare sighting which i got in corbett this is a animal which uh, usually resides at uh, 13 Uh, it's 13, a himalayan bear right sir uh, it's a himalayan bear it's a it's himalayan, a himalayan bear. bird uh, bear which resides at uh, 13000 altitude lucky for me so i had to if i had a 400 mm i would have made it even wider i had to show it where it, i saw that in the dry river bed in uh, jirna oh, oh, if i Jirna's. make it tighter doesn't make any sense whether you got it in corbett or whether you got it himalayas so show it with the habitat most of the time this is thank my thank you so much sir take on this thank you so much masood bhai uh, yes it bhai uh, uh, basically this is uh, this is one aspect of photography where uh, the making of image creeps in because no matter what gear you are using no matter what setting you are going through nobody is going to teach you or or basically um, uh, you know 
this is something which you cannot set true composition of any image will happen in your mind when you are right there you have very little time to think and that is where uh, you know you you got to make your mark absolutely but like for for example you were talking about the tiger when the tiger images the when the tiger emerges from uh, you know the bushes or, or you know it starts, starts shooting it it is natural tendency that you you don't want to miss a single moment of yes. its walk or its yawn or its uh, you know uh, whatever uh, behavior it is displaying that is when you got to be very alert and also analyze multiple things at a time ki what what exactly uh, you know you can bring into the frame whether you are, if you are using a zoom lens if you zoom out what are what will you include and uh, you know what has to be omitted from the this thing if if you can change a little bit of your position uh, will things you know change will will will, will it improve uh, the, the present composition you are having so this is okay. where uh, you can actually be try to be different and and make interesting images so i I'll, i'll take you through some of my uh, images please there. Uh, am i visible yeah yeah yes. visible sir okay so this uh, uh, this shot was uh, taken just along the bank, banks of pangong lake and uh, i wanted to include those beautiful mountains and and the gulls flying in the background and this shot was taken by my kit lens i i just uh, shot it maybe at about uh, 24 mm it, the lens used was the common kit lens 18 to 55 mm Uh, okay i wasn't carrying uh, my uh, wide angle lenses because i seldom use them so uh, i had to switch to uh, 1855 and i crawled on the ground tried to get a little closer include the habitat what whatever was available the natural elements and uh, everything and try to make this image Now this again is composition a very simple very ordinary bird you are, you are guaranteed to get this photograph if you happen to go to bharatpur there's there's nothing uh, you know special about it uh, it's it's just the 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 symmetry being used here uh, because it had spread its wings to you know dry dry them up after a dip in the water and uh, uh, that that twirled neck and those spread wings the patterns on the right and left uh, i i just used the symmetry here uh, and tried to compose this and this one is the same bird and give me a little different kind of a composition you know uh, i don't know whether uh, i i didn't even think okay whether it i'm following the rule of thirds or not i have just uh, you know you know my mind was just thinking whether it is in symmetry or not so this was the shot of the same bird at the same place now uh, getting into a little bit of maybe you know mammals mammals uh, this this shot is again vertical because uh, you can see that the the neck is raised very high and and there are there are other aspects also involved in this shot like the, the metering i said i i i personally like uh, low key images so there was uh, a little dark background there and i i further under exposed it to get uh, you know a little creative with the light super and this one i think is uh, another shot which uh, uh, which you can see i i have just used the reflection of the bird and those little natural elements around it the bird is almost in the center of the frame uh, there's no rule of third here applied again uh, because the other elements have been balancing it on uh, you know on the bottom on the right and on the left so my my bird is right there in the center i i think uh, masood bhai Uh, since we are talking about the use of natural elements that are there now uh, can uh, because of paucity of time 
can you show your that uh, natural history museum uh, special mention image do you have it with you andy i i do have that with me but uh, uh, okay that that is basically i wanted to show that under the category of uh, you know uh, making award winning images like you said uh, i i right. haven't uh, when when i shot it i didn't know it was going to win an award anyways uh, <laughs> so uh, i I'll, i'll show you that image if we are willing to but okay otherwise we will we'll come back to that question uh, i think uh, i i let me just uh, take a couple of more minutes and finish this yeah yeah please 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 so this one if you can uh, see is uh, relative composition uh, i'm i'm using another subject which may or may not be in focus but just to make it a little interesting i've included it into the frame beautiful so this one i am again including my habitat and uh, kind of minimalistic image where i am i'm just showing the entire feel of the uh, the forest here uh, with a very simple subject of course superb and this is the last one which i want to show is again wow. using, using natural uh, elements uh, a very selective light falling on the subject which is very small very minimalistic and and those flowers around it uh, making you know the frame a little more interesting so basically it all boils down to how how quickly and how differently you can think of getting something interesting into your frame and this Super. aspect this aspect is extremely independent about what camera what lens or what settings you are this is totally about how you think about something which is right in front of you super super thank you so much masud bhai uday bhai would you like to add on something to it uh, probably that's the last question that we can take so yeah sure sure jit bhai so i think like i will share and then i'll talk i think that would be much faster right? that would be great <laughs> yeah yeah no. so okay so let me know once you are able to see it yeah so we talk about us we are speaking about the close ups and habitat right so i think True. like i i prefer to like for me like uh, most of the cases like if you want to show any specific behavior of the subject then i will go very close to emphasize on what exactly i want to showcase so but mm-hmm. most of the times i think like i love to uh, shoot wide angle macros because like i think like these days wide angle macros are becoming famous from last 3 4 years i think like maybe i think 2 3 years so i okay. started wide angle macro in i think maybe 8 years back like when nobody used to care about that because i mm-hmm. i always feel that like for me like if if this snake is like any other snake like i really i will not be able to differentiate whether this is shot in which location what kind of habitat all these things so that's so why i always try to go a little wider so i'll show you so the same snake same place this was yeah. shot with an wide angle lens and like where you can clearly see the habitat what kind of area they they sit and whether they are on an arboreal kind of snakes or or a ground snakes right so this what i feel and you when you when you go wide i think like this gives you more uh, more practical impact than an uh, and an uh, what do you say for that like uh, the natural impact right like it's 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 more practical because like this is how i saw the scene and this is how i want my viewers to see that that image so because i did not really see the the complete uh, in an in an zoomed in kind of way right so because i think human eye can see somewhere in 44 mm or 45 mm um, length right so that's how we mm-hmm. see the image so i think like i usually uh, go with that kind of uh, wide angle frame not too wide because like that gives you a wrong perspective so that's why like i usually go with that that 40 or 45 mm so so there is an image where an uh, very rare snake there is a sand snake so which you can see that shot in the late evening 
where you can see the moon in the background and few other elements along with the snake. So this I, I prefer these kind of uh, shots rather than that. And when it comes to uh, composition, so you can see that like here. Beautiful. So, so this is on the left hand side is a cicada which is emerging from the from the uh, the the earlier stage of its life and on the right hand side like the dragonfly which is sitting on a very very uh, properly symmetrical leaf okay, so this is a mayfly so which is sitting on a uh, leaf so this kind of composition i i really love like brilliant brilliant and not too complex and you can you can take your viewers exactly what you want to show so that that I don't really do. Uh, so it's all it's all subjective, uh, Jitubai. Like it's it's not. There's no standard rule, right? Like you, I know. whether you want a portrait or a or a uh, or a uh, or landscape kind of image. So I think these days people are are moving out of. I think like if I know in the early days, like people had that intention of going everything in a landscape mode, right? I think because of thanks right. to Instagram and some of the other other social media platforms, people started looking things in a different way. Like now, now I think most of the people shoot everything in in uh, vertical, like on the portrait mode, right? So I think like we should look from all all possible point of view before shooting because shooting click is the last thing what as a photographer we need to do. The shutter click is the last thing. So because a lot of things you need to analyze like how the subject is, you just circle around the subject and see from all the angle. So which sure. is the right angle and how the background will be. All these things makes a lot of difference. And then the last and the final thing is just one click. So, and before I conclude, Jitubai, I just want to say one thing to like, like we have a lot of upcoming and established photographers here. So mm -hmm. for a photographer, this is just one click. Okay. So we are entering the area of either an animal or an insect or anything like we are, we are entering their, their territory. So if we don't get any image on that particular day, we are not going to lose anything. But if we destroy the habitat in, in, in search of one image. I think that's the life mm -hmm. for them, right? So I think like as a photographer, we should consider those points like how how we should care about the subject and how 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 very limited footprint what we can keep on their territory. So I think that that is very much important as an as an upcoming photographer or an even an established photographer. I think we should think about that. So if we don't, uh, yeah, at least I, for me, like at least for me, if I don't get an image on a day, I really don't mind because like it's, it's, I can shoot it any day. Like it's, it's fine. Like uh, even, even if it is a very rare moment, if I don't get it, that's perfectly fine. But uh, in, in, in search of that particular image, if I, if I step on something that, that I can't really take that. So <laughs> that's why for super, me, that's more super. important than an image. I, I, I think that's priceless. That advice that you have given is priceless. And I wish to, like all of us can imbibe it and uh, follow it on field. Thank you so much, Uday Bhai. Yeah, thanks, uh, I personally feel so like, uh, for me, if you ask me what's a good image for me, I would say, like, for example, I'm talking only about my perspective. Now, something that out of my thousands of images, for me, for a good image of mine would be something that I would take a print of something that I would put it on an exhibition, which I do every year on the International Tiger Day. I exhibit it and I put it up for uh, sale and the money that we earn from it, we use it for uh, some social cause and this entire 100% proceeds goes for charity. Now, for me, the benchmark is among the thousands of images, a good image is something that I would like to take a print of. And the print that I'm thinking of is purely from the customer perspective, who would pay Eight to 10,000 rupees for that particular image would buy that image, put it in his drawing room. Someone spending money to buy a print of my image and he would put it in his drawing room. If somebody is ready to spend that 8,000 rupees for that image and put it in his drawing room for lifetime, for me, that's an award-winning image. At least for me, that's, that's an award-winning image. I would like to ask the esteemed panelists, how many of you print your images with this kind of mindset i do how many of you i do no sir yeah i i know a lot of your images are sold for charity and all uh, you do a lot of charity work so 
on an average how many images do, do you get printed mon sir on an average every year see if i see a good image whether i sell it or not i make it a point to make a print out of it and keep it oh you keep prints and do you gift prints also to your friends and yes. family somebody comes home no if if so you gift a print if i i feel they can they'll appreciate an image i'll give it to them super masood bhai how about you uh, you do exhibitions i know that yes uh, i i uh, usually my uh, thing is i do one exhibition every year and uh, uh, like like mohan thomas sir i uh, in the all the proceeds are uh, for social causes and uh, that is the way i give it back to the society that's my happiness and uh, privilege to 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 be able to do something and uh, of course uh, even even uh, uh, for for friends and relatives who who really like my work i would i i, I always uh, you know kind of uh, try to print my work and present it to them uh, that is another way uh, so I, i i do a lot of print uh, I, i in fact now what i what these is i am doing is that i'm uh, since i'm a part of the college and we have a lot of corporates coming in for guest lectures and all I have to, uh, i'm giving them prints as gifts instead of uh, any other memorabilia i'm giving them prints something that they would cherish and all but most importantly for exhibition i do large large prints uh, large prints which are 3 uh, feet 5 feet those prints uh uday bhai how about you i i print very regularly jith bhai so even if i even if i don't sell it or anything so but i love to see my image on on a paper so at any day so even if the print is very small so the thing is like i usually when I, when i go for a trip i think like my expectation from that trip will be maximum 2 to 3 best images so i don't i don't expect anything beyond that so at least those three images definitely i will print and see that like how exactly it comes because so what you see on the on the monitor is completely different from what you see on paper so the thing is like you will really know the worth of your image or how how good you are as a photographer will be seen when you print your images i think like i really? i do print i do print a lot and definitely i i gift lot of prints like, uh, like i have <laughs> so i usually uh, do that so but uh, but i print Super. a lot so great sorry to Let's sorry see. to interrupt yeah yeah the, uh, the uh, trust that uh, jitubai Uh, uh told you all about i am very it's happy focus. yes i am very happy to announce that uh, jitu bhai is a secretary of that <laughs> so <laughs> trust and uh, uday also is a part of it wonderful i'm i'm, I'm in fact in fact uh, the kind of prints that we do and the kind of prints that have sold and uh, especially making a meaningful difference in the life of people who really matters see the the pictures that we click it's on, only uh, thanks to the, the forest guards and their families who have sacrificed uh, themselves so that the wildlife can be protected if we can do the, this this for that i th- i think that's a noble cause and thank you mohan sir for that initiative and really proud to be playing a small role in that thank you so much i would like to ask the uh, uh, participants today how many of you let's take a quick poll how many of you have ever taken a print whether you have been doing wildlife photography for one year or 10 years let me ask you how many of you have taken prints and how often do you do that a quick poll question guys brilliant so i i i think that's a great results coming in about 48% of the uh, participants 49 now 49% of the participants say that yes they do prints 27 of them have uh, said they they haven't done any, any prints 20% of them they said i need need to do prints and only 7% of them i want to know 
more details about printing and uh, connect with me so i i think that's a wonderful result friends i would i would strongly suggest that take a print your as uday bhai and as other experts have said so like your image how they look in prints and how they look in look on a wall especially so like in on a drawing room take a print start with a small size uh, one and a half feet and all it would look totally different thank you so much uh, the esteemed panelists mohan sir masood bhai uday bhai i think it's a pleasure and honor and a privilege again learning from you it's an incredible uh, life lessons that you have shared and this lessons in photography the pearls of wisdom that you have shared i'm sure it would go a long way in improving wildlife photography for those who have attended including mine and i can't thank you enough i'm i'm short, calling short of words to thank you for uh, for your uh, valuable wisdom and looking forward to many more learning sessions from you i now pa- uh, pass on the uh, baton to photo stop uh, thank you so much for uh, inviting us i i leave it to you now thank you so much and and uh, we are open to audience questions we will try, try to accommodate a few questions quickly as much as we can so i uh, i pass it on to you sir and then we'll take few questions few questions and guys do uh, do not feel bad we'll try to do as many questions as possible and the rest of the th- questions uh, uh, photo stop would s- send it to the, the respective uh, person that you are addressing this question to and they would be more than happy uh, the panelists would be more than happy to answer this uh, questions to you uh, to the best of their ability thank you so much right shri kumar sir all thank you to you sir yeah thank you thank you jitu sir uh hello everyone i am shri kumar and i head the photo stop division i would like to thank everyone for uh, joining us today i would like to extend my gratitude to jitendra govindani sir uh, mohan thomas sir masood hussain sir and ubdey hegde sir for sharing a fantastic insight into wildlife photography through the workshop today it was indeed an eye opening session on how one should perceive wildlife photography in fact uh, your style of delivering and sharing knowledge has been one of the utmost values to each one of us who are here today thank you all once again now on behalf of the presenters and the entire team of honeycomb we would like to thank take this opportunity to thank each one of you hope you had good takeaways from this workshop now i would like to request i would like to share a few words uh, about uh, my fine art print division photo stop Uh, photostop are experts in providing gigli printing or archival printing services for photographers artists interior designers and architects so uh, you can contact me on uh, 9901273816 or uh, shrikumar at honeycombindia.net the same has been mentioned in the chat that's all for now thank you all and over to you uh, jitendra sir for the q and a session all right uh, we'll make it very very quick uh, i've got a question interesting question from ron regarding ethics uh, ron says uh, this is for the mentors recently i saw a very famous wildlife uh, photographer uh, tour costa rica and he was conducting a photo shoot of hummingbirds in a staged environment of flowers on a clip and multiple flashes were used is it not unethical to use multiple flashes on a bird just for an image i leave it to the esteemed uh, panelist over here anyone can take it forward masood bhai uh <clears throat> sir actually uh, this is very controversial i again i you know i i would uh, give out a disclaimer first before uh, giving out my opinion on this Uh, i might be wrong i may not be i i personally don't uh, prefer to use flash uh, when i'm uh, you know birding at all because i i prefer to use natural light but again there is no uh, evidence as such from any authority or any university that uh, a flash can be harmful for a bird yes for nocturnal creatures who are in flight it can cause a little bit of uh, deviation for a microsecond but it is uh, there there's no uh, documentary evidence that it it is potentially harmful so it is you know better avoided that is all i can say perfect uh there 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 are question and answers if uh, for all the panelists 
I would I would request you there are a lot of question and answers there. So like uh, as of now the number reads eighty three. So is there like, uh, if you can answer few questions uh, there itself? But I am choosing few questions to be asked over here. Uh, one of the common question is uh, which which brand of camera Canon versus Nikon versus Sony? Which brand makes a difference in wildlife photography? This is the most common question that we come across. Is it right, Mom sir? It is a common the same. See, I being a Nikon person, it is not ethical to say Nikon is the best. No, all cameras are good. Uh, so uh, I think Nikon guys are also still watching. You are a Nikon expert. <laughs> I am. I am. But I I cannot say Canon is bad. I can. Okay. I, I, it will so, not be. <laughs> it will not so, be right on. Canon also is good. I'm I'm sure Uday Bhai was uh, had a heartful smile why because he's a Canon user. Yeah. Uday Bhai, what's your opinion since you are a Canon user? According no, to no, which no, camera Jindabai, is a, there is, is no 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 there is I think like camera all cameras does the same job like in one or other way. So the the naming convention or the buttons might be a bit different, but I think as of today I think every camera does the same same job. So it's the okay. the person behind the camera who makes the image, right? So I think like camera is just a tool. Okay, so basics they have to be right. And should not yeah. hesitate to keep clicking and keep learning yeah. from. Do mistakes. Very importantly, I would encourage people. Trust me. So, like I have met Nikon friends. I have seen people from Sony moving to Canon, Canon to Nikon. Nikon people also have moved to the other brands. So it's it's not the brand which matters. As rightly said, the person behind the camera matters the most. And very importantly, guys, uh, I I would say, learn to do mistakes. There is saying which says, do the thing that you fear of the most, and there would be no fear. Do not hesitate to make mistake, but uh, for me, any mistake is a good mistake. Or uh, failures are bad. People say I say failures are good because they teach you a lot of things. So I'm sure Monsa's uh, lesson was very expensive. That he had to go to Swalbard again, spend lakhs of rupees to to get the settings right. But I think the world is too small to commit all mistakes ourselves. We have to learn from the mistakes of others. Monsa's mistake is a learning lesson for us. You have the right to do new mistakes, but not the old ones. There is saying which says all men commit mistakes; only fools repeat them. Let's not repeat those same things. So, only thing is that do not hesitate to do mistakes. Attend workshops, learn from the experts like Monsar, Mas uh, Masubai, and Udayvai. Right. So, okay. Jitubai, Jitubai, you yeah. would like to say that uh, let Monsar make all the costly mistakes. We can learn from that. <laughs> <laughs> I I think Monsar can at least afford it. We, we can't <laughs> afford such costly mistakes. Yeah. But uh, Monsar, uh, I think uh, invaluable lesson that you have taught us today, and I'm sure we all would remember it for the lifetime. Okay, uh, uh, the panelists, which gear? Uh, in fact, so like uh, I take the liberty since I worked with all the three. Uh, Monsar's uh, Monsar's favorite gear is 600 mm. And uh, he uses Z9 along with it, and multiple cameras, multiple body. Masood Bhai, I'm a big fan of Masood Bhai. Why? Because he uses basic gear and he clicks award-winning images. Sometimes he he shames you with the kind of gear that he uses. So he is a real-time example. Uh, if somebody wants to know, so like it's not the gear, not the you don't need expensive gear to click an award-winning image. I th I think Masood Bhai is a go-to guy. I think I've learned a lot from him. Uh, Uday Bhai, I've uh, worked along with him for for months together for the Pinch Comfortable book. He he uses a Canon gear. He uses a uh, uh, 500mm f4 along with the uh, uh, 1DX Mark II, right? Uh, no, I use wrong? I use R5 with 500mm uh, and, and 7200, and then 100mm uh, macro for uh, macro. Macro. So, and even I use 15 mm uh, macro, which is a wide angle macro. So, with these two are one, one is to one macro lenses, then I use uh, 7200 and 500 mm for other things. Okay. Along so, with uh, 5D Mark IV and R5. Okay. Now, uh, thank you so much, Udayvai. I've got one technical question coming up over here. Uh, listen to this carefully, and any, any of you can answer. I have a scenario. While I'm shooting, I wanted to wide open or open wide f stop and 2x focal length along with the ISO, not more than ISO, uh, not more than 800 ISO. But most of the time, images are too dark or missing sharpness. Any tips to tackle the situation? I repeat, 2x focal length, 
he does not want to open f stop wide and he does not want to go beyond 800 800 iso images are coming too dark or missing sharpness any tips to handle this situation shoot in the right Anyone? lighting condition so i think like the use the right correctly yes, sorry like... what is his shutter speed uh that's not mentioned here so 2x so focal if, length uh, if you uh, we say this shutter speed now we can at least recommend something okay so uh, basically so like uh, should one be more uh, decided or fix fixated that i'll not go beyond 800 iso because of fear of noise is should that, somebody see, certain cameras have a limitation uh, in in respect to iso okay so after certain iso there they will start seeing uh, noise in their images so they don't want to go mm-hmm. above that iso but 800 uh, should be a, if he is seeing a noise at 800 it should be a very basic camera okay and why uh, he is reluctant to open his aperture i am not sure by, uh, is it because of depth of field Only okay if we know so- that we'll so so the person uh, can i can i take the liberty and say one should not be fixated about a particular setting only yes, you know sure. so like the pictures are coming dark and and one knows that so like uh, either the sharpness if the sharpness is missing and the pictures are coming dark that means the lights are not proper and the shutter speed is not there because no. it's if the image lacks sharpness it is only yeah. because of shutter speed am he i right can also, he can you can you can also check his exposure compensation ah true absolutely it to buy the same yeah. the images are dark and he doesn't want to go beyond 800 iso and mm-hmm. uh, if i'm not wrong he is he's using a 2x teleconverter 2x so, so i would want to uh, you know uh, explain that uh, when when you are adding a 2x converter it is not only doubling your focal length it will it will double all of your errors absolutely absolutely the amount of noise you are going to get doubles almost if not exactly but it it increases mm-hmm. any of your handshake again multiplies by 2x multiplies multiplies so teleconverter is not only multiplying your focal length it, it is multiplying your other problems as well so True. i suggest uh, he should uh, you know probably come down avoid using point. teleconverter either avoid using uh, teleconverter uh, or change the settings Yeah, one point four x. I think one point four x would do. Okay. So you try to use if you still want to use it. You try to use with with a tripod kind of setting so that like very, the, very the manual. Yeah, very manual error can be. Avoided. Okay, I've got a question now coming from Vikram Lone, whose question was something that I used to have in my beginning days. So I I I'm shooting this question to the panelist. If using a prime lens for mammal photography, should we always shoot? With a wide open aperture, that is f two point eight or f four, whichever is the widest. Now, if I'm using f four hundred mm, f two point eight. If I'm using five hundred f four, f uh, four. So, should I click at the widest aperture? So I- the basic, uh, basic uh, uh, thing we have to understand is when you are using widest possible aperture, your de- uh, depth of field is very shallow. Mm-hmm. very shallow and thereby if you are focusing on a elephant or a tiger if you are focusing on its face only the face will be uh, sharp and details there rest of the body if it is behind there will not be any detail on the body that is the disadvantage of shooting at uh, maximum aperture but if there is no light there is no other go other than shooting at f4 or f2 2.8 that's my my advice superb superb okay okay so i think like uh, there are few things which matters ajit uh, bhai so the thing is it's hmm. all even even if you are on a 500 mm so how close the to the subject you are like i think it's the distance between the minimum focusing distance and how close to subject you are so the more mm-hmm. closer you are and the, the depth of field will become more shallow so if if you are uh, further away from the subject i think like even if you shoot at 2.8 you might get the complete subject in in proper focus 
But if you go closer to the subject, then even F5.6 or F, F7.1 or like 8, 8 also might not give you the exact depth of field. So there are two things mm -hmm. which matters, I think, as a photographer. So one is, what is the distance between your camera uh, or your focus plane and the subject? And what is the distance between subject and the background? You need to consider these two points before choosing an aperture where you will get the the good bokeh effect and the subject in shaft. So this this matters more in macro photography, but it equally matters even if you are shooting a bird or an mammal. So I think so, that's so yeah. a wonderful point uh, uh, to be discussed. Uh, I, I think uh, Uday has brought up a very good point which should not be missed out here. Uh, if I'm permitted half a minute, I want to show a couple of images. Uh, very yeah, please. Point. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, So, uh, is the image visible? Yes. Yeah, yeah, visible. So, uh, what I want to very quickly show here is a very simple subject. I had uh, shot this uh, image uh, uh, specifically to show such an atmosphere. I am standing at a particular place and you can see what the background is. Basically, it's a tree trunk in the background and it is at a distance. So, it has uh, a little blur on it. So, I, I, I took this shot. Then I moved about uh, maybe 10 feet towards my right. And it is the same subject, I'm at the same place. Now, I have included a little bit of green here and that green is a further away. So a little bit of more blurrier background. That is how the depth of field is, you know, uh, playing around here. Mm -hmm. And uh, like Mohan sir says, okay, we are never satisfied. I moved another 10 feet towards my right. Just a moment. Yeah. And this was the final one. Mm -hmm. So a little ten feet. Uh, maybe just shifting my position and this was quite far away, this background. So the distance between the subject and the background, which uh, Uday was talking about is, is actually very, very important. And, you know, it, it determines the kind of uh, 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 end result that you will get quality of uh, background blur. And uh, this was a Gulmohar tree in the background at a little, at a little more distance. And uh, you can see the subject is same. It is at the same time. I, I just shifted my position. To, to improve my background at this point. So I just wanted to add this uh, over to you, Jitubai. Oh, uh, this, there, there is another question that, that's important. Touch-ups with editing tools, are they encourageable? Uh, this is a question from Jitesh. Touch-up and editing tools, are they encourageable? Monsa, I think you are a better person for this. I find no fault in uh, editing your image. Mm -hmm. So, see, your image just, you are click, first of all, you are clicking for yourself. You want your mm -hmm. image at certain quality. I don't think the editing is uh, uh, any big sin. You can edit your image as long as you are not manipulating it. And uh, and even if you are sen uh, submitting it for uh, uh, competition, editing is allowed as long right. as you are not manipulating it. True. You can edit your image. That's my take on this. Okay. Uh, Masood bhai, uh, Uday bhai. 
I, I am plus one with the monster here, as long as you are not manipulating it. Uh, I would also want to add that post-processing is a very, very, very important aspect of uh, photography because that is again one place where you, uh, without manipulating or without you know potentially uh, damaging the image or, or adding artificially or removing something from it, you can actually enhance because no amount of technology can replace the human eye. Uh, what human eye sees, the camera will never be able to see, at least in the near future. True. Of course, technology has improved, but there will always be uh, there will be a difference between the colors, the contrast uh, between what the human eye sees and what the camera. So to compensate for that, you are allowed even by the competitions to use uh, uh, post processing, and uh, it it can be done in a very very creative and very uh, and proper way to to only enhance your uh, existing good shot. Uh, of course, I would also you know want to add that a bad shot cannot be repaired by post processing. Only a good shot can be enhanced by it. So, so it, true. it can be. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So what, what Masood Bhai told is absolutely true. So I think the dynamic range of a camera which, which can capture the dynamic range is almost like more than 10 or 15 times uh, less than whatever I can see. So, so the thing is to bring uh, to the certain level, you have to enhance or, or you have to uh, improvise your image what you shot. So, and when you, when you shoot a raw image, absolutely it is necessary because you are just capturing the raw data, not the processed image, right? So that's why I think it is mandatory to process the image or to bring it to the certain level. So, but unless and until you are, you are not uh, misrepresenting the scene, what you have seen. So I think I'm okay with that because like you should not give the wrong impression of a landscape because I have seen it with a lot of landscape photographers okay? because uh, I don't want to take any names or I don't have any problem with personally with anybody. So, but the mm -hmm. problem what happens is I see an image of a landscape, which is extremely beautiful and with uh, the different things. And when you go there, so there are several structures are not there. Okay. What you have seen. I really don't like that, but like, see a beautiful cloud or a colored cloud, I can agree because that's a dynamic thing, right? With today, there might be cloud with a light. Tomorrow, when I go there, it might be a very flat uh, scene, but uh, removing a subject, even for any genre of photography, I really don't prefer. So, but, but enhancing is, of course, it's needed. Perfect. So I think uh, it's almost time, but there is one question that has appeared by diff uh, different people many a times. There are a lot of questions we are still unanswered. Uh, so uh, we are very sorry. There are 80 unanswered questions still. So uh, we'll take it later and we'll try to answer all. Please do, don't worry. We'll try to answer all, but we'll send you the answer personally. But one question which majority of the people have asked is what's the best camera for wildlife and which is the best lens should I use for wildlife? Again, See, when it is like uh, they are asking about uh, any specific model or uh, the lens, what do you recommend strongly? See, this uh, uh, first thing uh, when, when such questions are asked, number one is what is the person's budget? Right. Number two, whether, I mean, what is the subject? What is the, his favorite subject he wants to shoot? Okay. And third thing I would say is whether he's very regular in photography. If he goes once in a year, he might as well rent it out. That's a great idea. He might as well rent it out instead of buying and next year your camera and lenses uh, outdated old model. Yes. Okay. So the first one is Basically, see, I, I shoot with the Z9 and the 600 or a 402.8. <coughs> see, if you are a hmm. mammal shooter, a 402.8 will be ideal for you. But, but when I suggest 402.8, if you want to shoot birds with that, then you will, uh, you will later on say, I have not, <laughs> I don't have the uh, required focal length. I, I should have bought a 600. 
so these three things you have to answer yourself and buy your equipment superb superb uh, uday bhai and uh, uh, masu bhai would you like to go into it i i think what you have in your hand is the best camera man so everybody whoever is doing that like you might be having mobile camera or a camera so that's the best camera first read to the potential what that camera can do so then mm-hmm. think about what else i can do right so i think like i always say that what you have in your hand is the best thing so because like that's a never ending story like uh, today you buy something and tomorrow it that becomes outdated so for people like mohan thomas i think like uh, it's it's easy <laughs> easy <laughs> <laughs> but but for See, us, like I, I, think, I, I will I will tell you one incident. One person initially he was a Canon person. He he didn't like Canon. He came to Nikon. Then he bought Nikon. Then one day he says, "I want to move to Sony." And all this in one, uh, one and a half year. Ah, <laughs> I want to move to Sony. i said what is the equipment you have and this is the equipment the same equipment another person a bird photographer has the same equipment were you able to get anything like this no first prove yourself with what you had true then go for a better <laughs> camera otherwise what do you know whatever you earn you only the camera manufacturer will make money absolutely right make the best of what we have i i think rightly said masood bhai your final thoughts on it sir you are on mute you are on mute i'm sorry uh, i i'm plus one with uday here uh, basically uh, whatever camera you have is the best camera as of now to start off with but again uh, considering some practical uh, you know facts that you have a budget to you know buy a mediocre camera and a lens then i would suggest to go for a mid range camera and uh, you know a, a prosumer lens uh, the kind of don't get into the race of uh, high focal length like mohan sir said because uh, when i bought my uh, 300 mm mohan sir was using 500 i thought i will buy 500 then by the time i reached 500 he moved on to 600 mm and <laughs> came with me uh, <laughs> So this race is never ending. Don't, don't get into that <laughs> focal length and all. Uh, buy a buy buy a good uh, prosumer camera to start off with, uh, depending on your budget. And uh, yeah, there are there are many good options uh, these days, and uh, you can choose one of them. Two hundred to five hundred or two hundred to four hundred is a good focal length. Uh, go with a zoom initially so that you can do birding as well as mammals and all that. Uh, yeah, that's a good way to start off. I can say. superb superb i i think we can still go on but like uh, again as i said uh, scarcity of time and please understand guys uh, we are here for you you can reach out to us any time we'll be more than happy to help you out to help you grow to to guide but rem- always remember never feel shy to ask for help because if you don't ask you don't get and if you, if if you don't get if you keep doing old things you will keep getting the same results so if you want to go, go to the next level do not hesitate to ask for help ask for guidance find a mentor mentor for life and so like go ahead and learn by doing mistakes on field if you have to learn swimming you have to jump into the pool if you have to learn photography you have to be on field field in the sense need not be a jungle start if you want to experiment with the settings you you you, uh, you 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 can't experiment in the real jungle in front of a tiger which gives you only few seconds do it in your backyard do, uh, do it on the outskirts click any subject let it be a lango yeah, let it be a bird yeah please your uh, suggestion here basically the best way one of the best way to learn is to look at other people's photographs whom you admire try to read those images try to understand what the photographer photographer might have thought about it the way he composed why he did it so what was the lighting condition approximately and you know how he must have uh, you know uh, thought about getting that shot and what must have been the settings get out on the field make mistakes learn from them and repeat that is that is not repeat the mistakes of course the process it it, it goes on uh, uh, that is the best way to learn 
and uh, also jitu bhai i remember you talking about the award winning uh, images at all yeah nobody is sure that any of the image will win an award nobody i i wouldn't nobody. believe that i have you know by the grace of god and the support of uh, so many mentors i have managed to get a few awards but i never knew when i shot that these these are going what i would want to add here to all the beginners and intermediates here is try to get the best try to be different try to think different and if you don't like your shot it is not going to win an award that is one thing i want to add here just for the sake of posting it on social media or sharing yeah it, it feels good to have 1000 uh, likes on your image that's that's another story but likes are not the measure of how good you or bad your photograph is trust me on that so get serious uh, get on to the field be patient perseverance and uh, be stubborn on it try to be different only then you can get shots which are eligible for award winning so if you think your your image is award winning it is eligible for winning an award and then these awards are again you know there are there are panelists sitting there there are judges sitting there mohan thomas sir can tell you more on this there are True. five seven different people sitting there with different mentalities with different perspectives so what what an, is an award winning image for me might not be an award winning image for uh, image for mohan thomas sir or, or uh, jitu bhai so it it is it is just about trying to get there trying to get some good shots and enjoy your work brilliant very well said very well said so uh, it's the process of image uh, process of making the image which makes more interesting than the the final image i think the end result when you start I... enjoying the process of making the image i think then then you you improve yourself like so even 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 for me like if i see an image which i shot last year and if i feel that that is the best image which i shot then i am not growing in any way i should feel that okay i could have done better with that image if i see it today so then then it's it's a good path so if you still think that the the image which you shot 4 5 years back is the best image then you are you are absolutely wrong so that means that you are not growing so you should you should be a self critic on your image as masud bhai told i think like that's the best way first you look at your image and look the same image after 15 days what you could have done better so i think that that makes a lot of difference jit bhai very well said very well said mohan sir would any any uh, final no, thoughts from I, your end i would like to say thanks <laughs> thank you hanikom thank you jitu bhai and thank you my co speakers it was wonderful seeing all the images thank you for giving me this opportunity uh, thank you thank you so much sir absolutely and uh, nofal sir uh, shri kumar sir kartika ma'am uh, sanisha uh, georgi i i think the entire team of anicom thank you for organizing such a event such a wonderful learning session and very importantly not only uh, i'll come to the panelists later but uh, there are, i see uh more than 135 people online still i think do we are way beyond the time limit i think you waiting on shows and says loudly that you are really serious about improve, improving your photography i really appreciate it and i thank you from the bottom of my heart and my express my sincere gratitude for your seriousness and your commitment to improving your own self the there is a saying the journey of 1000 mile begins with a single step and i am sure you have taken the right step in the right direction and i wish you luck and assure on behalf of all the panelists that we would be there to help you in your journey towards self improvement count us in whenever you need any help reach out to us and we will be more than happy to help you out thank you so much uh, mohan sir uh, my What's sincere well. heartfelt thanks gratitude masood bhai Ude bhai, no full sir, Sri Kumar sir, all of thank you, you thank you sir, heart, heartfelt gratitude. I think uh, it was a wonderful session, and looking forward to many more interaction, many more learning from each one of you. And thanks to all the viewers who yeah. stayed there till now. Yeah, hope uh, this session was of some use to you. That's absolutely. Team. So thanks to uh, the Honeycomb team. I think they they put a lot of effort behind it. So I think like absolutely. Think, yeah, <laughs> I think like Indeed. so we were we were completely occupied on different things. I think still they were following it up like I think multiple times without hesitating. I think like that's that's a great thing. I think they they put a lot of effort. 
thank you so much to them and i'm really really thankful to them and i think like a lot of people joined and they were very patient i think we could not answer most of their questions i think like it was kind of one way talk but still they stayed i think i really love to thank them in in all possible ways we will we'll, we'll try you. to answer as many questions as as, as, far as possible in person or sure. so like uh, through mails thank yeah, you so yeah. much guys hope thank hopefully you. see you soon uh, for some other uh, workshop thank you thank you thank you thank, thank you, you thank you sir thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.